Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we are happy to hear, happy to see you here today, and uh, have you join us for a lively discussion around um, implementation best practices and other topics around project management solutions. Um, today, we're uh, we are focused on the debunking implementation myths and misconceptions. And this is the second in our series of webinars around project management systems. We had a, a webinar earlier, uh, about a month ago, um, where we discussed some of the uh, things that you want to think about when you're acquiring a system and evaluating a system. Now we're getting into the implementation. And then the next webinar, we're going to get into more of the what you can expect and how you can connect um, from uh, project management solutions that are out there. Before we get started, this is the one piece of information that I read, so I apologize, uh, but let me quickly walk you through how we're gonna get the, the most out of our webinar experience today. At the bottom of the screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area by clicking that box or to maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We will try and answer those during the webcast, but if a longer answer is needed, we or we run out of time, it may be answered later via email. As a reminder, the webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. I always find that funny to read because if you can't hear us, you're not gonna hear, us, hear me give you that uh, in information. Um, you can find additional answers to common technical issues located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed during the same audience link that was, set up with, that was sent to you earlier. Um, I will reinforce and uh, say again, please ask questions. Nothing makes us more nervous than sitting here talking to hundreds of people and not getting any feedback or questions from the audience. So um, please share your questions. We will try to get to them all. We use those as uh, some of the discussion topics, so they are valuable to us. And I would be remiss if I did not go over our safe harbor disclaimer which says that uh, we're gonna talk about things that aren't necessarily in production for any solution or system. And anything that we talk about today is not an obligation for us to do it in the future and is not a, um, any sort of an indication that that is part of our roadmap, even if we say it's part of our roadmap. Um, so uh, with that, I think we'll move on to the less formal areas of our presentation today. And um, uh, I'll introduce you to our panel of experts and, uh, um, and then we'll get rolling. So Chris, if you wanna introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks Tom. Uh, Chris Watmore, uh, principal at RSM, part of our management consulting technology advisory practice. I've uh, been working in technology for about 20 years. I've spent really, you know, about close to the last 15 years working heavily in the construction and real estate industry. Um, you know, devising IT strategy, IT roadmap, helping clients pick and implement uh, software. We're an agnostic, um, you know, software advisory uh, consulting firm that works with, you know, all manners of software uh, providers out there to help our clients sort of pick and implement the best solutions to help drive their, their businesses forward. So uh, appreciate the time and happy to be here today. Dave? Uh, Dave? Yeah, thank you. So I'm Dave Anderskow. I've been in the construction industry for about 28 years. I actually have the privilege of wearing two hats. I'm the CFO of a large commercial general contractor in Chicago called Power Construction. And then about 14 years ago, started a consulting group called Palmer Consulting Group. Palmer serves the construction industry uh, by helping you improve your organization's people, processes, technology. Uh, we, we have uh, people on our staff that all come from the construction industry and some functional area of expertise to help lead you through any changes that you're going through, whether that be uh, implementing new systems, 
assessing your business processes, trying to optimize and improve those for your for your teams. I uh, have a team of developers that they do everything related to data and integrating systems so that they speak to, to each other. And then uh, one of the things that uh, is close to my heart, because uh, I've always regarded myself as a change agent, is that we have some experts on our team that help you with uh, organization change management and then changing your your, your uh, roles and your, your team design as you implement new things, go through leadership transitions, et cetera. So I'm excited to, to be here. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, and my name is Tom Brooks, and I am with Trimble. I've been with Trimble for 19 years. I've uh, come through many of our businesses across, uh, always in the construction information technology side and on the, on the software side of our products. I spent um, the majority of my career in the project management space with our Prolog project site and um, ProLiance products, but I'm now the director of strategic partnerships and channel sales for Trimble Construction Management Solutions, which means that I get to work with, um, with people like Chris and experts like Dave in creating additional value for our customers across our ecosystem. And, and uh, we understand that our ecosystem is inclusive of more than just Trimble and uh, the Trimble employees that are out there. It includes those individuals and experts out there and CPA firms and consulting firms and implementation firms and uh, system integrators that are out there, as well as um, complementary and even competitive organizations for software that we would integrate with because our our solutions are um, are put in by many many customers that have got lots of uh, software from lots of dis different vendors inclusive of Trimble and then lots of third parties and that's something that you got to think about as you're doing an implementation and so one of the, the things that we look for to anchor some of our discussions around our experience of the past. So, you know, what can we learn from what happened in the past to guide us in the future? And so when we look to some of the statistics that are out there, um, everybody has probably heard something similar that 49% of projects have got scope creep. That is, um, you know, things that weren't defined in the project, unexpected stuff that uh, was not controlled and caused an impact, usually financially on, and on schedule. And it's usually detrimental. It never has scope creep that people say, well, we got done cheaper and faster. Um, so it's usually detrimental to what you plan to do and it takes you off the roll. That's almost 50% of the projects that are out there. So it's almost to be expected. So you've got to plan for that. Uh, and then project failures, 32% of software projects fail due to poor requirements management. And I've seen that and experienced it and would agree. Um, however, that, that seems like a lot, but uh, as far as a third of the projects that are out there, but I would say that there are elements that fail because we didn't plan for it. And that those are things that, you know, to the best of your ability is to plan. And planning starts with a data book. That's the way that you avoid chaos. And so as we talk about um, our, uh, experiences and our shared experiences, I've always found that like this, this idea of a data book uh, or a project charter that talks about what your objectives are, what you are all going for and starting with that, and then a data book of, of elements and integrations that you're gonna do to, um, uh, to be very valuable as you kick things off. It's primary to, to what you're going to build your projects and your plans around, and it should be a living document. If you can't identify what you're doing in the future, you should take a step back and, and understand how to define that and, uh, um, and get that defined before you move forward. Um, I'll turn it over to Chris and Dave to add color to things here. I mean, I could just read right down the list and go through things, but you guys have got lots of, um, lots of experience in the field. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, I think, um, you know, a couple of key points, you know, when we start talking about implementations, 
Uh, you know, what I find, you know, a lot of clients do is, you know, they sign the, you know, they, you know, they've gone through this, you know, hopefully gone through a selection process. They've looked at a bunch of vendors, gotten a bunch of demos, probably got wowed with all the capabilities and features, right? They sign on the dotted line and they're like, all right, let's go, right? And, you know, that, you know, I, I think that that's a huge misconception um, that it's like, hey, let's, let, you know, hey, let, let's press install. It's not, not, we're not implementing Microsoft Office here. We need to sort of take a step back you know, really define what we want out of sort of, a, you know, a, you know, from a strategy to an implementation strategy, whether it's a phased approach, a big bang approach, how are we going to do it? You know, what is the people side of it? You know, really spending some time to think through it, um, you, you know, you know, not only project management, really any technology, you know, you, you really want to think through sort of what the technology is, what you really need versus what you want, um, you know, and then, you know, really sort of think through and plan that out, and especially sort of towards the end of it, you know, really advocate advocating for enough time for data migration testing and training um you got to do that up front you really got to think about that uh elsewise you're going to you know be targeting a go live date and all of a sudden it's going to come and you're going to realize the organization is not ready for it and um you're going to rush it and you know you, you could see your entire implementation fail uh and adoption just drop off of the cliff because you know we didn't spend enough time you know thinking through the change management thinking through training and the adoption side of things thinking through the data and how we get that over correctly um, so that people have a smooth initial experience, right? And I, you know, I, I always tell people like, you know, whatever time you're thinking about for testing the system, let's double it. Um, because if we can have a smooth user experience, right, you know, you know, as sort of a first step for these people, um, that, that's a, that's a major win, uh, you know, as part of a part of an implementation and you're going to avoid a lot of chaos, right? When you got bad data, people are going to complain real fast uh, and chaos and chaos will quickly uh, ensue from that that perspective. So, Dave, I'm sure you 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 know you, you've got some insight as well. Yeah, I think uh, what you just described is a little chaotic, right? All the the different elements of a implementation. It's not just about the software itself, but uh, there's all those other components from training to data conversion to integration of, of different point solutions, etc. So, uh, it does take a lot of planning. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, the, the first bullet point there on project charter that don't get too crazy writing a, a, a book, but you know, I think uh, a couple pages, uh, I think first and foremost, identifying who's going to be on your implementation team. Uh, you know, I think we all are in the habit of looking towards some of our best uh, people and tapping them on the shoulders. Uh, sometimes those people are, are really the best in their positions because they're really good at client relationships or, uh, negotiating uh, the company through mitigating risks, things like that, that are very important to a contractor. But uh, we we found uh, success with the uh, you know I'll call them the B players, the the players that uh, really rely on sound practices and processes to get their job done. And sometimes it's better to to tap those people on the shoulders because they they know the processes maybe even better than some of your eagles. Uh, but I think the other point on people is that we you have to uh, not look at this as a part-time job, something that get, can get squeezed in. Uh, the, it, it's not something that, hey, we already know that you have a heavy workload, but in your spare time, can you implement the system? That, that usually is a, a, a disaster right there. Yeah, that's a great, great point, Dave. I mean, I, I think just adding on to that is I sort of listen to you a little bit, um, you know, as you start thinking about sort of the project management process around technology implementations, like, you know, oftentimes I see, you know, general contractors, smaller specialty contracts, they might not have an IT project manager that's used to implementing software, right? That's where you might want to think about bringing in a third party project manager who really understands understand sort of IT or technology project management. Uh, I was working with one general contractor and looking at their project management processes. And, and I just looked through it and I was like, you try to manage software implementations like you're building a building. And it's very, very different. Uh, you can't you can't manage a, a you know project management software implementation like you're building a building. Right? You don't know who's coming into the building and you might not even care who's coming into the building that you're building. But with software, you have to care about that end user. So now if you don't have internal project managers, like there is a discipline there that is going to uh, you know, really pay dividends uh, if you don't have someone internally, you know, look to the third party, not necessarily from the, the vendor themselves, but someone outside of that to, to help along the way. 
Yeah, definitely. I think uh, we, we did a, uh, um, an implementation with a general contractor recently, and we created a project charter with their team. That was one of the things that we did at the kickoff meeting. And we spent a lot of time just uh, surveying the crowd that were was in attendance to get to, you know, kind of a visioning exercise of what does success look like once the systems are implemented. And the CEO of the contractor said his was quite simply to free up his project managers so that they would have more time with their customers as opposed to uh, being behind a computer or pushing paper. And uh, as we were implementing the system, we would check back in on those success factors, refine them uh, based on what we knew uh, at that point in the project. But uh, also we used them for different decisions as they were looking at changing uh, who was responsible for example getting uh, the progress billings initiated and, and done uh, there was there was a new role that came out of that they never had a project accountant so we we actually recommended an implementation of, of a new role and refine their processes to achieve that success factor along with their implementation of a new system And I think that's um, so. I I think there's some interesting things that 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 have come out, and that that's a that's an interesting experience or a good experience that um, that you that you've been through, and and finding new roles that come out of implementation best practices as you as you roll a solution out or you're planning for them, um, that there are going to be those epiphanies that uh, that come about, and you need to seize those opportunities because what you're Generally, organizations are trying to get a, a additional um, additional value out of a solution by putting technology in. So, if you're on a project management system and you're switching to a different one, you're trying to get additional value out of it. If you've not had a formal project management solution that has been implemented, obviously, you're trying to get additional value in the con project control that it can bring to you and identifying those and, and taking advantage of them as they appear is important. And even if you don't take advantage of them right at the, at the very, very time they appear, it's important as part of your project charter that you've got a parking lot for those types of things that you can come back to and say, ah, yes, we wanna put a role in for, um, for this type of situation or for um, uh, to, to get this value out of it. So that once you're up and live, uh, you, you're able to take advantage of it. Um, you know, as, as uh, Dave and Chris were talking, I was taking some notes and the word chaos, even though it's on the screen here, um, the word chaos came up five times that I counted. And, uh, and it really, an implementation can be chaotic. And by planning well and sticking to your plan, you're going to not eliminate that chaos, but you're going to really minimize it. And having, I think one of the other things that I that I wrote down was having a project charter is important. And I think Dave said, um, you don't have to write a book, right? It needs to be distilled down. And I agree with that, that you need to be able to have a objective and a project charter that can be recited and understood and consumed by everybody in the organization. It, it does not need to be uh, full of, um, of all kinds of, of thoughts that are esoteric and not understanding. You've got to be able to distill it down so that if you get in the elevator with somebody on the fourth floor, by the time you're down to the first floor, they understand what you're doing. Um, and I will say that, you know, involving the right people. Uh, someone said, uh, you know, tapping the B players is important because you get a lot out of them versus the eagle. And and I think what was being said there wasn't your B players as in people who are not performing as well, but it's those that really know how an organization operates. Those people who are, um, are instilled and understand the process is soup to nuts. They can give you the best understanding of and ideas and thoughts around how to make those processes better because they live them but also make sure that your meeting sticks and your teams stick to the one pizza rule of you've got to have an organization that is nimble enough to be able to make decisions. 
And one of the things around that is even though everybody's not in every meeting, if you communicate out and you put newsletters out or you communicate on a reg regular basis as to what you're doing and set expectations, then everybody who feels like they should be a part of that team or has an opinion on things will be read in and will be better understood and more accepting of the of the changes as they come because um, to, no matter what it's going to be changed as you implement these these systems um, inexperience in this can cost you and i don't think that uh, anybody who puts in solutions at a, at a contractor even though you've been through it a number of times you don't have the experience that um, a, a a Chris or a Dave or um, somebody from Trimble does because they're doing it every day, every single day over and over and over again. And that's that's what they should be doing. And, and in your organization, if you're a project management professional or a VP of projects or a, uh, a controller or in, in the office of the CFO, uh, you know, your job is to manage projects. Your title is project manager. You should manage projects. Finance manager, you should manage um, finance. If you're an, an IT manager, you should manage your information technology infrastructure and bring in those um, those professionals uh, or lean on folks that have got experience in implementing solutions and best practices over and over again. So 55% of IT professionals said that um, they had a project fail due to lack of time, staff, resources, budget, and planning. Those are, you know, if you have uh, um, set a time, set enough time apart to be able to do these implementations, if you staff it correctly, you're really giving yourself an insurance policy because uh, you have got those things in place. These are the biggest pitfalls that are out there. And I'm not sure again, whether it was Dave or Chris that said, it's so important to not that have this be a volunteer firefighter position that this is uh, your core group's primary thing that they do over the period of the implementation that this is their full-time job they're measured on the outcome they're responsible for the objective that's in the data book um chris and, and dave anything to add up to this point no i mean i, I think uh i mean it's a good point is, is you know figuring out your your staffing model your um you know your resource plan right i mean you know some people can't dedicate you know their full time i think one of the biggest things especially on the it side that you see is people forget that they already have a you know 30 40 hour and a week job so you know how do you reduce that how do you augment it right um you know do you bring in some staff augmentation for a period of time like how do you how do you sort of create time within the organization to focus in on this. And there's definitely a number of different strategies to, to do that. But you have to remember that, um, you know, you know, if it's in the back office, finance, IT, HR, um, you know, core operations, you know, you, you need to understand, like, you have to create time for these people to dedicate on it. Right. And then, yeah, like you, you want some people that are dedicated to this that are going to be real champions of the project. Um, and understand, you know, sort of the portfolio of projects going on, whether it's an IT project or an other corporate project that's going on and how they impact each other um, and understanding the resources getting in it, right? Because everybody wants the A players, but uh, they can't be on every project and, and do their day-to-day -day, day work. So, um, you know, understanding those resources, you know, planning budget, adding contingency to your budget. So, you know, whatever you're planning to spend, like add a contingency. Uh, on there, um, you know, from a budgeting perspective, just in case something does happen or you need some additional resources uh, or you want some piece of functionality that you didn't think you needed at first. So, um, you know, all things that are important as part of that project management process. Hey, Chris, do you, do you have any rules of thumb as far as adding in contingency, especially for, from a project resource time commitment from, from for the client? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a specific rule of thumb. Uh, you know, it depends a little bit on the organization, but it's usually between 10 and 20%. Yeah, I, I would say that my answer would be the same on that. I think uh, you, you've probably been through many interviews uh, with prospective clients as well as I, and uh, I, I like to turn the table a little bit on them at some point during the interview process and ask them what they uh, who they have set aside and how much time have they budgeted with their internal team. Uh, and I would tell you that uh, the majority of 
the clients would respond that they don't know. <laughs> and uh, that's usually where we start. <laughs> We had a we had a question come through too, Tom, about uh, you know uh, you know project charter templates uh, online. So um, I don't know if you want to tackle that question now. Sure. So so there was a there was a question that came across. There's two questions so far, and keep the questions coming. Um, so the first question is: We are a small company. Are there project charter templates online that we can use? So yes, there's plenty. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean, go, you know, if you generally Google, you're gonna probably be able to find some pretty common templates that are out, out there. Um, you know, most of your vendors probably have a template. Um, you know, if you've got any good, you know, just general technology partners, they're gonna have templates. You know, there's sort of you know new way of uh, uh, of doing it. Uh, you know, if you go to ChatGPT and type in some information and ask it to create a project charter, uh, it, you know, there's a good chance that it's going to be actually to be able to create something that, that you could sort of build off so you don't have to write the entire thing yourself. So, uh, you know, it's sort of it would be an interesting way for you to sort of at least create it. Um, you know, you feed it a bunch of data, a bun bunch of things about what the project is, you know, and, uh, you know, it'll probably create sort of an initial initial, uh, you know, swag swag at, uh, at, a, at a product project charter. I haven't tried that myself, but I bet it would be pretty decent. Probably, yeah, pro scarily so, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, um, and then there's a there's a second one. Uh, is there an average implementation time so I can set the team expectations? I don't think, in my experience, I don't think there's an average um implementation time your vendor will be able to say um the average implementation times and and i can tell you it'll probably be they'll look at the size and they'll look at the solution they're putting in and it'll be three to six months or six to nine um those are those are the time frames they'll give you but i don't think that you can really gauge what's going on it really has a lot to do with your objectives how um coordinated you are and it's going to come back to, and, and if everyone notices, I went back a slide purposefully um, because we were talking about resourcing and we were talking about contingency. It seems like, you know, um, it, it putting in resources, budget, and planning uh, for, for people is, and adding time to staff is going to make that budget go larger. But your contingency will be smaller, if, I guarantee if you do these things, if you staff it correctly with full-time people and you have a project charter that is well understood and a data book that is well thought out, like, and the data book means what are my work streams? So what are the things that I'm going to want to automate and have manual and operational processes around and how does the data flow? And if you can bring that to an early implementation meeting, and hand that to your implementer and say, this is basically we want, what we want you to build, they'll be able to see that it's in picture format, swim lane, or in, in some sort of format. They'll be able to see that and build to it so much better um, than uh, and faster than, uh, than they otherwise would. The other thing that I was going to, um, that I was gonna uh, mention is that your time frame to implement your success and your contingency will also be greatly reduced if you focus on the 80% or you focus on what is um, uh, what is important and don't look at the edge cases. You can spend 80% of your time talking about things that only happen 4% of the time. And yes, when they happen, they are very important and they are very hard to get around and they're very complex issues, but they're not the issues of the day. The issues of the day are how to run your organization and how to manage projects effectively and keep your project managers managing. Um, you're always gonna have the edge case that is out there and you're not gonna be able to solve them in a conference room on a whiteboard. It's gonna take some time of, of experience and, and basically having people that are out in the field or using it on a daily basis, figuring out the best process to get those things done. Um, any uh, any thoughts, uh, Dave, on on that? Yeah, I think if you look at a software implementation, it, it's not really about the software. It's really about you're changing how people do their jobs. You know, and it's not just the where; it's also the how. You're probably looking at process changes that could impact the 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 time that it takes to train people up. 
um, breaking bad habits of going to to Excel or or Word to get their jobs done. And uh, you know, it's that it's that people aspect of really, hey, let's make this thing stick. Um, and that that does become, you know, I think uh, part of the uh, success or failure of a system is just that adoption rate. And if uh, if if you can identify those type of what I call manual processes or areas that are inefficient and have that be part of how you're going to measure the success of the new software, then I think uh, you know, we've I think what we're saying is that implementations are hard. So you better be able to shine the light on here's to your organization why why not only why you were doing it, but then after the fact, here's here's how we measured the success. Here's here's what we got for all that trials and tribulations. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, and I think that um, uh, that success measurement and publishing out those successes is important because you want your team internal and external to feel like you're um, you've got a lot of you, you've you faced a lot of challenges in an implementation and you've overcome them and you've had these success factors that are out there. And um, and one of the places that that can come from is uh, the person in charge and, and who is who is running it and who gets all the accolades and where the buck stops. And, and Chris, when you go into a client and you start talking to them about implementations and, and sometimes I, I know you, you're, you and your firm are brought in to sort of perform a rescue or somebody who is maybe adrift in an implementation and don't know where to go. Um, you know, who is in charge when you walk in and, and do you walk in and is that a pitfall that you find that there's not really one person that's in charge, but there's a there's a committee or a team or nobody knows who to look to for what? Uh, I mean, I, I, I you know, when we're going in and, and rescuing the implementations, it's usually the factor of, uh, you know, someone somewhere, uh, you know, selected a so solution, selected a tool and said go. Um, and there isn't a project sponsor. Uh, there isn't a steering committee. Uh, there hasn't been sort of the formalized, you know, um, you know, structure around uh, around the project put in place, right? And that that acts as two different you know areas. One around controlling scope and messaging and communication from an executive per perspective, uh, direction of, of the implementation, making decisions on the implementation from a, a changes, a scope, or requirements perspective. You know, helping you know remove roadblocks, uh, getting resources and whatnot. Most of the time, when we're going in and finding you know implementation, sort of. Uh, you know, off the rails, it's usually because there's disagreement on, over scope, there's disagreement over requirements. Um, there isn't someone sort of, you know, a, a, a project sponsor at the top that's responsible for sort of removing those roadblocks and making the final decisions. Uh, you know, and there no, there's no sort of subcommittee underneath them, a true steering committee that's steering the project uh, and telling the project team like, okay, no, like we've come together, we've made these decisions. Uh, you know, and sometimes that means elongating the project or add, adding funds or adding resources or making functional decisions around it. Um, and, you know, resetting a project, you know, comes back to, uh, you know, trying to lay out all those decisions that need to be made uh, that are blocking the project, uh, as well as understanding sort of the people components in terms of, you know, what is happening at the people level and how they are uh, working with the vendor uh, and each other to sort of make decisions uh, around the software and how it's going to be configured for, for future use. People, people are critical to success. Even though we've got ChatGPT out there, you still need people, and uh, um, and people are gonna they're gonna make or break a project. Um, both that are on the project team and those that are out there um, around the water cooler, and that are gonna be the users. And that kind of leads into um, sort of this next theme or or the next slide that we've got here. And I'm and I've been kind of jumping back and forth on on slides, but um, we had a we have a question that. That is, besides communication, what other methods have you found helpful to encourage change and positivity amongst those who resist change? I think embracing, um, in my experience, and I've done large and small implementations, the best ones, and, and if you're on the last one, one I always like to talk about is Disney, because I think Disney does a lot of things right, obviously. And they are very inclusive where they have got a project named. So they named their implementation project something. It's project, um, you know, go forward or project, uh, um, you know, whatever they named it, I can't remember. Uh, and they 
have got either they created or they asked the vendor for, um, you know, little things, coffee cups, uh, pencils, pens, uh, a little bit of things to make people feel like they're a part of the team, even if they're not part of the the um, part of the meetings that are out there. And this slide that's here and the, and the comment that we're making is that, you know, mastering a new technology is disrupting and frustrating and not for those that are just implementing it. And that is very, very true. I mean, when my kids went from a Windows based laptop to a uh, Apple based laptop when they went to, to college, they were very, very frustrated because they had been used to Windows their entire lives. They didn't think they were going to master it. And it became very frustrating because of the change. And now and they're and they're technologically aware. They're astute. Right. And um, and it's I saw that, you know, through a little bit of perseverance and hard work that they adopted it. And the reason that they did is because they're part of this team and culture of everybody uses Apple College. Right. They didn't want to be the one person with the. Uh, uh, a Windows laptop sitting in the study group or whatever. Um, and that is the same thing that you can do with your with your team and your extended teams that are out there. Embrace them, put newsletters out, make them be a, or have them be a part of um, of the uh, a, a very small presentations around the outcomes that they can expect. And then one of the other things that that we've done as a large organization, when we put software out, is we say, look, here's all of the things that it can do for you. Here's the here's the five things that you really have to do, right? You can't get around these fields are required and they're required for a reason. And if people understand that, then they, they generally do pretty well with it. I don't know if Dave or Chris, you have anything to add there. I think that goes best into our next slide where I think between Chris, myself and Dave, we don't think eating the elephant in one bite and taking a big bear, big bang rollout with software works particularly well. You may be forced to do it at some times, but you know, going through and and uh, um, and taking the implementation and taking the thoughts around it in smaller chunks tends to work a lot better. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think that's that's huge, especially in, you know in in the industry and. You know, getting back to the question around sort of those who resist change, right? I mean, you want you want to upset those people more. You you do a big bang implementation, right? And you're gonna up, you know you force it upon them. Uh, you know, I, I always like to take the you know the people who are more adopting. Uh, you know, are are okay maybe with a couple couple issues or a couple bugs. You know, up front. You know, put that. You know, get them on first. Obviously, you don't want to take a project maybe that's towards the end of its life cycle, uh, you know, from, from a job perspective and, and sort of get all that on. But, you know, something that's, you know, either just starting or, you know, on the cusp of starting, you know, start there and start get the right people who are you know good with computers, you know, you know, can, you know, can adopt the technology and get them up and running. Right. And, be, you know, make them like a beacon of the technology. Right. And then you take some of those people who are resistors and say, say like, hey, you know, we're going to go, you know, we want you to go do a you know, an audit of, of job site ABC uh, and see how things are going, right? And then have that person, you know, that, you know, that, that project manager sit down and be like, oh, yeah, and this is what we're doing. Uh, oh, yeah, like, you know, watch, watch me, you know, you know, run my whip reporting and, uh, and you know, and, 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 you know, hey, let me show you the change management, right? And then all these people who are resisting the change are, are going to be like, whoa, that's so much easier. How do I get this, right? <laughs> like, you, you know, you got to create demand um you know around some of this right and you know depending on your your workforce and their adoption of technology and their resistance to change you want to really think about that right versus yeah shoving it down everybody's throat all at the same time right because you're gonna you know create a lot of chaos uh there and a lot of unhappy users that you're not gonna be able to sort of serve all at the same time all right and you know getting back to the whole you know you know data and data book and project charter right i mean these are all important right and understanding the data uh you know aspects and the data migration is is absolutely huge getting that that stuff right right especially with user you know starting with users that are more acceptable of hey you know there's an issue let's fix it you know without you know going in potentially bad mouthing the software right you don't want that sort of underlying tone to sort of hit the organization because it can quickly uh you know, undermine the entire pro program and what you're trying to do there i'd add on that there's always somebody on your team that you know that is is critical and uh, 
they have good intentions, but they're usually very thorough. They, they'll challenge, uh, you know, maybe even aggressively. And if, if you can stomach it, having that person on your implementation team uh, so that now they're taking those shots before you're rolling it out is very helpful. I, th I think the other thing is that I, I follow the with them strategy, what's in it for me. And if you have representatives from all your different positions, departments uh, on, the, on the team, and they can identify the, what the wins are for their teams, uh, then chances are that to help, it's gonna help minimize that, that change resistance that otherwise you would have, because you don't wanna go into it. Things will surface from that, from that approach, because if something works for, uh, for accounts payable, but now you're putting burden on a project manager or project engineer, that's not, that's not a win-win solution. So you have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, how do we get to that win-win solution for all parties uh, across the table? I'd agree. And, and even building into your, into your data book and project charter, the idea of a, um, of multiple phases in an implementation is important, setting that expectation and having measurable objectives out of each so that you can define success and show success or how close you are to success. Or if you are, if you did fail in the first section, how to, how to correct that for the second, the idea of um, a, uh, an MVP, like, you know, what is my minimal viable product that I can put forth from an implementation that I can get some of my early adopters out there using and giving some feedback on is important. And so, uh, you know, again, we can't stress enough how how important that that data book and project charter are because they are they can become the nucleus that you build all of your plans and your planning around. And I would say that the vast majority of we say this stuff and the, the, the vast majority of implementations that I've come into and I used to be on the sales side. So I'd attend the first implementation meeting or two and then I'd pop back in and um, uh, you know, see how things were going or understand how things were going. Um, whether it was in a challenging or a non-challenging, I would ask, how's the data book? How is the project charter? Are you living up to that? And you would really see that those that were flourishing and doing well, they would know exactly where the project charter was. They would know how it's changed. They would know how they measure up to it, more or less. I mean, it wasn't scientific, but um, they knew how close they were to hitting the objectives. Those that had no idea, I don't know where that book is. We never ever really got that off the, you know, we got really buried with getting data rather than figuring out what to do with the data. Um, those went uh, sideways quickly. Um, so we're coming towards the end of our time today. And I wanna make sure that if you've got questions out there that you ask um, your questions because uh, um, we wanna make sure that we include as many of those as possible. So um, we, we just got a question, which is, how do you reroute implementation that has had a rocky start and middle? No concrete plan, plan no lack of, internal, a lack of internal support, no written processes, and no metrics for success. So yeah, like what I was just talking about, walking into that, and, and uh, how, do you, how do you reroute an implementation that's done that? I have my um, opinions on it, but I'll let, uh, We'll start with Chris on this one and, and have him give, him, give his thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, mean I, I think, you know, no concrete plan, lack of internal support, written, no written policies, no metric for success. I mean, that to me screams, uh, hey, we need, to, we need to hit a pause button and sort of reset, you know, the implementation. Like, did, you know, is this the right software, right? You know, how much are we spending on this? Um, you know, let's make sure that we, you know, let's recreate our, our plan. Let's make sure, let's regain sort of internal support. And sometimes that means doing, you know, demos again. Uh, it's, it's bringing people together. Um, you know, it, it's really sort of resetting, you know, the entire project, you know, and almost starting over, not, not the whole project. Cause obviously you've got, you've got some stuff, but you need your project team to sort of re galvanize around what we're trying to do. Right. And bring, you know, I'd start and be, bring everybody else to like, all right, you know, what are we trying to do here? What are the pain points that led us to looking at a software implementation? All right. And let's say like, hey, what, what, what do we absolutely want to, you know, want to be success criteria for the, 
for this and this. Right? You might come away being like, look, like we need to just kill this project, um, you know, and, and and walk away. And and sometimes that's the right answer. But uh, you know, more often than not, you want to just you know reset. You know, what are we trying to accomplish here? What are why did we do this in the first place? Get everybody agreement on that, and then say like, all right, you know, what is a reasonable way way to get this done? And how do we rebuild some support around it? So, Dave, I, you know, I'm I'm sure you've got some experience here too. But you know, so you know, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, hundred hundred percent agree with what you said, Chris. I think I, I would add in on top of that, just finding the root cause, finding if you can, you know, doing a little uh, team dump to find out, hey, was the problem with uh, you know system setup and configuration? Let's make sure that we're tapping the vendor and our, our resources to, to reevaluate that, or is it the training? Uh, is it that our team isn't spending enough time with uh, testing and validating the data that was converted over? Uh, just really doing that, that internal uh, um, soul searching to get to the root cause that will help you then determine the best path forward. Yeah, I like to bring my clients off site, tell them computers away and have everybody fight, face a whiteboard and just start to whiteboard out what's going on. Like, hey, let's talk about the project team. Let's talk about the tool. Let's talk about uh, our resources. Let's talk about our goals, right? And, you know, get everybody's just really, really focused in and all sort of facing, you know, facing the problem together uh, is a really great sort of strategy, right? You don't, you know, as soon as people start facing each other, Right, it becomes combative. But if everybody's facing the problem together, right, everybody's facing a whiteboard, and you're starting to brainstorm of what we're trying to do, right, you're going to see some of those root causes come out, and you're going to start to see sort of, hey, how do we come out of this and, and refocus ourselves to, to to move forward? Yeah, and and I and I great great point. Get away from the computers. Get to a whiteboard. I always like at this point if you've got if you're in this challenge position. Um, standing at a whiteboard and saying, okay, let's fast forward and say it's a year from now and say that we got this back on track and it is and it is a success. What are the successes? What are the things that we're going to say went really well? What are the values that we're getting at it? And then you can um, get those objectives down. You can use that to form a project charter and you can say, okay, now let's get ourselves back on track around these objectives and around this charter and rally towards that, and then you've got a team that's going that's going towards it, uh, and, and everybody moving in the same direction. Remember that uh, the worst technology implemented well, more often than not, will deliver more value than the best technology implemented poorly or even so-so. Uh, it's not always about the tech, it's about the implementation, the processes that are behind it, and it's the people whether it, and, it, and it comes back to the people, it just does, and avoiding that chaos. Uh, we're getting short on time, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna let you all know that if you've got additional questions or you uh, um, want to reach out with uh, specific examples or have discussions, Chris, Dave, and myself are always more than happy to uh, um, to have a discussion. This is what we we live. We're passionate about these things. Um, if you didn't take anything out of this today, if you screenshot this or take this out of it, um, you know, from an implementation tips, how, you know, how important project charter, stay focused and, and agree on, on those goals and focus on those goals and stay on the page. Don't go to the edge cases. Um, get agreement from key stakeholders on your goals and timelines. Make sure your executives and your stakeholders in the field all agree to that. And so you've got one team to go back on and, and rally forward. Uh, um, create your defined and obtainable rollout strategy. So do it in a realistic way. Don't have people leave on Friday and say, hey, have a great weekend. And then Monday they come in and what's this new system? I can't roll it. You know, I can't do anything. Change, especially surprising change is always challenging to people. And then communicate, communicate and communicate. You cannot over communicate what you're planning, what you're doing, and how things are going. Everybody understands that there are going to be delays and challenges and things where you may need to bring in, um, you may need to phone a friend or call in an expert, and that is great, and people, um, people appreciate that. We've got some upcoming events that we want to make sure everybody is aware of. The next uh, um, 
in this series of webinars, the third and final is on project management and it is uh, uh, it is on October 18th at 11 a.m. And we will be joined by, um, uh, his last name escapes me, but Gary, I just spent a week with Gary in Chicago uh, and he is our expert on integrations between project management systems and uh, ERPs, other project management systems, estimating and other that is out there. And so we'll be able to have Gary talk about the integrations and then have others that are on there as well. We've got in-person events that are coming up, Brews and News Happy Hour on the 19th of October in Arlington, Texas at the Revolver Tap Room. I've not been there, but I'm sure it's delicious. And then do not forget and mark on your calendars the Trimble Dimensions User Conference November 6th to 8th at the fabulous Venetian Resort in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, if you are going, please, please, please sign up for hotel rooms. I think our block only goes through October the 6th. And if you are not part of the conference block, it's like 700 bucks a night. And I can tell you, it is a total bummer not being at the conference hotel because taking a cab over there or walking over there from another hotel, it'll look close on paper. It is a hoof and a half. Um, uh, final final thoughts from Dave or Chris. I say as you're going through an implementation, check in with your people. Don't and don't look at it just to get to the go live uh, date. I think the the rest of the world starts at that point. So make sure that you have some some sort of pulse surveys with your with your team, go out to your job sites, do a little shadow training, make sure that they're, they're using the, the, the system, the reports, as opposed to relying on their old ways. You gotta break some habits. Yeah, take, take your time, remember change management, uh, take care of the people, take care of your people, right? Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's the big thing, you know, be inclusive, uh, think about it, uh, think about them, uh, take them on a journey. Right. Don't just, uh, you know, give them a bunch of technology, take them on a journey and celebrate your and successes. Celebrate your successes and uh, embrace experts that are out there, whether they are consultants, whether they are uh, um, CPAs and those that are already in your ecosystem, whether they are from your vendor, whoever your vendor is, uh, they have got experience and they will give you a shoulder to cry on and they will give you a slap on the back when you deserve accolades. Uh, and, um, you know, rely on them heavily. That's part of what, what you pay, that's part of what you're paying for, and it's part of what you should get. Uh, thank you again for showing up. Thank you again for being attentive and for the questions throughout. We'll answer any that we didn't get to uh, uh, after the fact. And again, if anybody has any questions or wants to talk to any of us, we're more than happy to answer questions or set up a quick call uh, to discuss specific situations. Thank you, and uh, we will talk to you again on October the 18th to include Gary Stowe from uh, Trimble and the expert on integration. Thanks. See ya. <laughs>